Welcome to the Dealmaker Show, the number one place for entrepreneurs and dealmakers to learn about leveraging and generating status, frame control, and narrative power to close big deals. Here is your host, investment banker, deal-making expert, and best-selling author of Pitch Anything and Flip the Script, Mr. Oren Claff. I'm very happy today to introduce a guest, Patrick McGinnis. He is, uh, well, you know him because he coined the term that everybody's familiar with is FOMO, fear of missing out. And so you probably have a shirt or a coffee mug or something on it with that uh, or, or just saying it. But fear of missing out is a primary driver and lever in negotiation and business and business deals and sales, but also in life. And Patrick is a really interesting guy. Uh, when he was at Harvard University, scary smart, published a book, uh, The 10% Entrepreneur. I'm not going to, you know, as it's applicable, we'll talk about that. But uh, let me let me bring Patrick on here and let's get into I have some questions for him about some of his views on deal making, raising money, putting money into businesses, entrepreneurialism, but really focused around deal making. So, hey, Patrick, thanks for coming on. Uh, hey, I'm here. Yeah, good. Well, uh, so when I say thanks, you don't have to say anything. You can just go. Um, what would it, so unfortunately we have, he's scary smart and we're not conflict driven here. So we have to come up, as I was saying before, we have to come with good ideas because, you know, you put Ben Shapiro and Jim Pisaki on a podcast and like, you don't have to do anything. Right. And just conflict emerges. But I think we agree 95% on things. And so the challenge here is sort of to go into the things, you know, and I know, and sort of plumb deeper into what's working, not when you went to Harvard, not when you launched the event, you know, when you were in private equity, not when you did your big deal, you know, my big deal 15 years ago and your big deal, but things that worked 90 days ago up to six months from now, like that's the window of deal making. I feel like we have to focus on to give people something that they can leave here with and go execute. And I listened to some podcasts that you were on. Uh, and have some questions for you. But first of all, how did you, everybody asks you this, but I'm interested. How did you come up with the term or the phrase or the idea FOMO? It's a major psychological lever, as I said, in everything we do. So in some ways it was sitting there just obvious in front of you, but how did you surface and put it into the national consciousness? So basically I was a first year student at Harvard Business School in 2002. I had just seen, I was in New York City the day that the Twin Towers fell September 11th. And after that, I sort of was like, the world is so unpredictable. You know, I was working on Wall Street, I had like a stable job. And then all of a sudden, like overnight, I was like, oh my God, you never know what's going to happen. I got to live for the moment all the time. But I was still working all the time. So I didn't have time to really live all that much. And then when I got to business school, I found myself in an incredibly choice rich environment. So many opportunities, socially, professionally, intellectual, intellectually, but like mostly socially. And I would find that I was like triple booked all the time. And I tried to do everything and I was basically stressed out. It was like, I had all these good things, but I couldn't really enjoy them because I was trying so hard to get to the next thing that I could do that day. And I realized it wasn't just me, it was all of my friends. And we had not just had 9-11, but a lot of us had worked in the tech sector, which blew up in 2000, 2001. So we saw our livelihoods disappear. Like we all lost a lot of money. So it's kind of like a little bit like right now where you're like, the world's kind of screwed up. I got to live for every moment. And so I, you know, I noticed it was a culture of the school that people would, would try to do everything and they could barely do that. So I started calling that fear of missing out or FOMO. And I wrote an article way back in 2003 in the school newspaper, 2004, excuse me, in the school newspaper called Social Theory at HBS, McGinnis' Two Foes, all about FOMO and another foe I invented called FOBO. Well, I, I, think, I think I just heard the introduction, you know, or the trailer for the, like the movie Blow, right? Like, <laughs> like oh, hey, where are we going to put this money? I don't know. Stack it in the fucking laundry room, right? Uh, I'm so bored. I got laid three times yesterday um, by, uh, you know, some uh, recent graduates from Harvard Law School. And, uh, you know, okay. I don't know. I'm on the board of Microsoft. I don't really want to do it. So target rich environment. A lot coming at you. New York City. Be 
careful what you ask for because you might just get it. I think, and this is a cautionary tale, whatever you're coveting right now in America, coming out of COVID, economy is, you could get it. Just, I always think about it, not to interrupt you, uh, but since I am, you know, the dog chasing the truck, you know, the, 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 the trailer, uh, you know, for a movie with that probably has uh, some, some very famous, handsome actors in it, but they're now they're turning like 65. And so <laughs> there's a truck going down a dirt road, right. And there's a farm and he's, you know, kind of grizzled and wearing a hat and the dog is chasing the truck barking and it's very idyllic. And, uh, but the dog ch catches the bumper of the truck. He's like, what do I do? You know, I've been chasing trucks for five years up this road. I caught the bumper. What do I do with it? So be careful what you ask for. You can actually get it. So you get everything you ever dreamed of and more. You're the star of the movie blow. And now what happens? That's the problem, right? Number one is half of the things you wanted. Once you actually get them, you realize they don't make you happy or they, they aren't as good as they looked or whatever. Cause you create, you created a whole story in your head and you hear this from people all the time. It's like, I got to the top of the mountain and I realized there was nothing there. Yeah. And so like, yeah, so you got it, you did all these things, but like for what? And I think that's what the problem is, is that if you just try to do a bunch of stuff and you're like collecting notches on your whatever, what does that really get you to? And you, you're, you're busy. You, and so, you know, you, you got stuff going on, you feel important. But what have you achieved? Okay, but hold on. So you don't get to say mm. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to say I had all these amazing experiences, and we don't get to hear about any of them. So let's go back into turn of the century, New York City, dot com tech money is everywhere. You get out of Harvard Law School. What are some peak? peak experiences that you just you you knew were out there but you never and i'll, I'll set the stage because i was you know i was there too here in silicon valley um i was trying to rent a apartment and the apartment managers were like mm, when you see your credit report right and they looked at my credit report and they're quite invasive in how they look at it but in the meantime i had a dot com funded and uh that we didn't have a corporate bank account or an LLC or anything formed fast enough. And they had to get the money out of the VC. So they put $3 million in my personal bank account. Wow. And it was literally like, how do you like them apples? Apartment people. And so I never imagined there would be one day, you know, my bank account would go from $300 to 3 million. Uh, and, and so that was a peak experience for me. But what are some of the things that you went through that were too exciting for you to handle? Yeah, I remember, listen, I remember, this is before business school actually, but I, you know, I'm from a small town in Maine and I'm living, I'm doing venture capital in Latin America and I'd fly to Miami and we were looking at, we were investing in everything. I mean, people were putting, they're investing crazy amounts of money on companies that had no traction. I would stay at the Delano Hotel, which was, you know, new back then. And like, basically you're like on the beach going to all of our startups were based on Lincoln Road in Miami. And you're literally going from one building to the next and just like writing memos to get your partners or the firm to invest five or $10 million in these companies. And then going to like their $1 million launch party in Sao Paulo the next can you Can I, hold on, I just want to check with legal because I don't want to get sued by anything Patrick says to me on this show and be complicit. Is the statute of limitations? Oh yeah, okay. The statute of limitations <laughs> is gone from uh, two thousand and one. So, so you're writing right. So you're you're writing deal memos to try and get in in what and and what's one of the weirdest things or worst things that you knew you shouldn't be near, but you were just. And I think now we're going to roll into FOMO, but the the question is answering itself here. But what uh, what are some of the things that you knew you shouldn't? touch but you felt like like just tumbling into yeah there was a lot of them i mean the reality <laughs> is, this was like you know it reminds me a lot it's like right now kind of feels that way a little it's like yeah. people are writing heat i remember we had a company and listen I, I, all these people like I, i'm not being mean but we had a company that came in the door and it was a music website and it was started by a rock star like a famous rock star in Latin America who I shall not name. 
And he was, he'd never done anything in the business world in his life. And he, his claim to fame was that he invented internet time, whatever that is. And so he would give his pitch. He'd be like, my name is X, Y, Z. Probably can Google this now. He's like, I invented internet time. I'm an Apple master. I have this idea for business. And he put together a round of financing and there was no business model ever. And I just remember being like, we were just like, what? Like, like this is feels crazy. You know what I mean? And we had, I remember we go to our Monday morning meeting. We had so many memos and we invested it. I don't know if you remember Cosmo, Cosmo.com. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. that was not my group, but like we had guys going out there. This company was burning like crazy and people writing checks and checks. And it was just like, it felt, I mean, it all blew up in the end and like, it was insane, but you just sort of felt like people were doing, there was no fundamentals at all. And as an investor, when you're just investing based on FOMO and there's nothing behind it, like everybody just does it because you have to, you're expected Wait, to do there, it. Wait, there was no fundamentals at all? Like Grimes taking a Xerox copy of her butt and selling it for uh, $3.5 million? Like no I mean, fundamentals like that or, or like even, that. yeah. It's all liquidity driven, right? It's just like yeah. the greater fool theory. It's like, well, if I invest, then somebody's going to come around and, you know, in three months, we're going to get a step up valuation. And then like, you know, I look like a hero, right? So it was, that's what it was. It was all momentum. You're, you're hundred percent right. So then how did that, so seeing that happen, being in there, writing checks or trying to write checks, seeing crazy business models, being, you know, on the East coast, having money fly by you, uh, and just seeing, you know, fives and tens of millions of dollars everywhere, people instantly who had never been in business suddenly being worth a hundred million dollars, uh, and, and all of that happening, then where did your mind go from there? So my kind of view was, cause I'd never been through this, right? I was right out of college. I, you know, and so it was, it, my kind of view was, well, you know, it, the, the, uh, the incentive here is to just do more of this. Like until my bosses tell me to stop, you know, who am I to say that I'm wrong? We've never seen this before. Maybe this will be valuable. You know, there are other people out there validating this. And so I think this is like the kind of corruption of the soul is that you become the system rewards you for, for playing within it, even though you're doing things that like, if you were to step back, you know, they don't, you could not justify them. So if we pull the people listening in here, I'm looking some of the uh, some of the comments. I mean, uh, you know, have you? By the way, have you seen the 2022 Porsche GT3? I mean, it's not like oh, cars aren't my thing. I don't care what's your thing. Like that car is amazing. If if you look at products now, they're so smart. They have so much data. Mm -hmm. They're so dopamine driven. Uh, I mean, there's the new Corvette. If you look at some, you know, some of the houses that are not mansions, but just the way they're building smart houses that are connected, they're using the same space, making it feel open, having these sort of Balinese style doors, windows that track along things and open up and make you feel like a billionaire in Los Angeles in a suburb in Iowa, like the, the, the ability to design stuff quickly, to embed it with graphic design, principles of design, inject dopamine and everything, have data and have quick uh, development cycles. Like everything is amazing right now and there really are things to covet. And so you've seen this, I've seen it. I, I, have, I have a quick story, but sort of what happens when you get the things that you desire because there are really desirable things out there. They're made of dopamine. We want them. We work really hard. We get them. Uh, it's not greater fool theory. It's not sort of beware what you ask for. You just might get it. What is happening in your mind? We don't have to get into like the biology, you know, when people are really wholesale getting the amazing things they covet. That's good. I mean, that's, that's what you want. I think, I'm not saying, by the way, there's things that I, I have lots of nice things that I want and I enjoy. There's no, there's not, I'm not saying that's bad, obviously. Okay, you realize you don't get to say that without giving a, like, this is the detail. But, you know, the other podcast that lets you get away with saying those things. This is the other one where you can't just say, I have lots of nice things without giving us some examples. Sorry.
Oh, well, well there's I, a painting behind you. That's very nice. Well, this so, isn't my yeah. house, but this is a very nice house. I mean, I live in a great loft in Tribeca in New York City. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I have cool stuff in my apartment. I have, you know, bought some good art, you know, I travel to nice places, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, but what I'm getting at is that when you have FOMO, you are, you want everything, right? You're not focused. You want a million different things and therefore you'll never be happy because you're constantly coming up with something else that you want. And usually that is not evidence-based. It's based on perception. And so all I say to people on that topic is like, think about what you really want, what you actually can afford to have, and then go after those things. But spending a lot of time pining for the thing that you can't have or afford is not, it's not, it's not a useful use of time. Maybe it's a motivator. And so, yeah, great. Use it as motiv uh, motivation. But so many people spend their lives looking at their next door neighbor and wanting their life. And they have no idea what that life actually consists of. And it's a waste of time because as you gain knowledge in life and as you gain wisdom, you start to realize like, you know, you, when you are so busy that sort of coveting other people's stuff, you're degrading all the things that you have, even the good things. And it's just a useless waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, if you're listening to this, I know what you're saying to yourself. Patrick, that's a bunch of bullshit. When I get my first Ferrari, I'm, you know, I'm going to appreciate it more than, you know, you would ever think I worked really hard for it. And I deserve it. I've covered it my whole life. I had the poster on my wall and then you're going to get it and you're going to go, those two dummies were completely right. I don't even know, you know, uh, I don't even know what to do with it. Hey Matt, could you kill the air conditioning, please? God, thank you. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so I, I had a guy, he sold his company for $400 million. Right. I go over to his house. He lived in a little suburban house in Claremont Mesa in South San, well, mid, mid South San Diego, uh, two bedroom, there's a three bedroom, two bathroom, sort of classic suburban house at the end of a cul-de-sac, a little too close to the freeway, you know, to be a nice house, you know, probably at that time. So if this was 15 years ago, you know, a 30, 40 year old house already, you know, nice suburban living coastal. Sold his company for four million. I go over the house. There's a Ferrari F40. There's a cigarette boat. There's a Porsche Twin Turbo. Um, there is, you know, three other cars and a Scagliati 1956 Monza winning Ferrari, like open wheel, like just parked in the driveway because he just went banana. Thank you, my God. Uh, thank you. Uh, and he just went bananas. And I see this happen over and over and over again. So we're going to get into deal making now, but it's kind of a faulty formula because I think we're going to talk about some ways to really go make the biggest deals of your life, get some capital to go do those deals, get out of those deals with a huge success. And then you have arrived nowhere. <laughs> uh, I, uh, a friend of mine just got a job with a billionaire walking in. He told me uh, in Los Angeles, very well-known guy. If I said his name, everybody here, well, not everybody, a lot of people would recognize it. He walked in, he said the executive admin or the assistant, you know, at the front desk, he goes, you won't last six days, right? And he's like, I know what it's like to work with. He's a designer. Uh, it does CAD CAM. He's like, I know what to work with these tough personalities. And now, 10 days later, he's leaving. So, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to work in these high dollar, high stakes, high velocity of capital environments. They're very stressful and sometimes not. Well, I worked for a billionaire. High velocity of capital, Rodeo Drive. Um, high volume, high stakes, you know, and I like clung on by my fingernails for a year and a half before it just started spinning so fast, it ejected me off. Mm. Want to talk, so we want to talk a little bit about money. What are you seeing happening? And do you have an opinion on what's happening with money today? It seems everywhere with the NFTs, with crypto, with crypto billionaires. I interviewed a guy back here not long ago. He goes, I'm buying every Bitcoin I can. When I say not long ago, probably six years ago, it's like I'm buying every single Bitcoin I can get my hands on, uh, maybe five years ago. And uh, really well-known guy. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And now, you know, he's either got $900 million or $1.9 billion, you know, is on either TV or the web every single day. There's just, mm -hmm. so crypto, uh, NFTs, the public markets, venture capital, and private equity exits, Capital just seems to be falling from the sky. I don't know if that's your experience being in the financial markets, but 
what's your opinion on what's happening today with the availability of money to do the things you want to do? Yeah, I mean, you're 100 right. By the way, if you think about it, let's just like think about some of the things that are happening. Number one, private market valuations. Like, I I have like four friends whose companies just became like billion dollar companies on paper, on paper, right? And you're sort of like, and you know the numbers, and some of them you're like, okay, I can sort of pencil that out. Okay, great. And you hear other stories, and you're like, okay, that's a company that has, you know, there's no, I can't, I, like, I just can't even figure out how we how we make sense of this valuation. And so where is that money coming from? Well, it's coming from your retirement, by the way. It's coming from your your you know your pension fund, which is which is kind of crazy. I think the crypto market is, you know, again, it's like there's so much going on there, but there's also tons of people, you know, we we only focus on the people who are making money. There's lots of people who are getting in and out and getting hurt. Same with a lot of these other digital assets. So I think at, you know, we never we don't talk about the company that fails. We don't talk about the person who loses money. We don't talk about the GameStop investor who got burned, right? Because that's not aspirational. That doesn't play well in Reddit. Um, but it, there is clearly a ton of liquidity, a ton of liquidity. And I, as the as somebody who's lived through and gotten super exposed in two financial blowups, 2008 and 2001, you know, it feels like that all over again to me, which makes me feel sad. But then again, like I've been calling the top of the market in tech for like nine years and it hasn't happened yet. So like, I just don't know anymore, but there's way too much liquidity out there. And, and my concern, I guess, is so, like, what's that? So, so I want, I want to comment. I, something you said here uh, is I think, you know, people can put this in their pipe and smoke it uh, is that the, the, we only focus on the 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 media, the focus on the wins. Medium, if you're subscribed to Medium, not to be mean to Medium right now, that is a place you go to learn how to write headlines, mm -hmm. learn how to write copy. If you're taking information from Medium and applying to, I, I think it's more insidious than Instagram mm -hmm. Medium is. Because that gives you the sense of, I, hey, I wrote three emails and started a $14 million company. By the way, now you don't have to go to Medium. That's every article, right? In on on Medium, uh, and and I know some writers there, but there there is the sense that everybody is winning. That you could take a shit on a donut, turn it into an NFT, and that can be sold for six point nine million dollars or sixty nine mm -hmm. million dollars, everything. But um, the the everybody is not winning, and you know I have a friend at Goldman Sachs who just calls me every other day and says we need to start a loser magazine and it's going to be a lot fucking fatter than winner magazine. And you need to have the profiles of, so if you're on medium and you're on Instagram, get yourself a dose of wake the fuck up because that, I mean, I, I mean, this is not insight that Instagram is highly, you know, curated and, and, and those things, things are, are fantastical. Um, but you cannot hustle that hard. You cannot work that hard. You cannot be, uh, everyone who wakes up at 5 AM and works all day and puts in the effort cannot become the rock. Do some people become the rock? Sure. The rock becomes the rock, but the people who go all in, who hustle, who burn the bridges, uh, I mean, feel free to fill in some cliches, you know, from, from Instagram. And, uh, so I'm going all in, I'm burning the bridges at the shore. Um, I'm, I'm leaving no stone unturned. Um, I'm, you know, I'm betting the farm, you know, all these things, really most of the people who go down that road, come back really financially wounded, emotionally wounded. Uh, and, and sometimes in a five to 10 year recapture cycle of energy and stability. And they will say a lot of things like, Namaste after every, if you, if you find somebody right and every two minutes are going namaste, right. And they're not a yoga instructor. That's because they went all in on some business thing. They lost everything. And then they snap back the other way to sort of meditative egalitarian social consciousness yoga. Right. And there, there has to be a middle ground where you work hard, do the business you're in, uh, you know, achieve some level of success, strive for strive for success, but going all in, with any expectation because everybody else is being painted with success that the, the, the um, 
really you can set yourself up for failure. Yeah, and you know what? On top of that, all these people who say they're so sec- I mean, by the way, there are people who are, I'm not begrudging people who do well in these spaces. Like you have to have some guts and some vision to go early into some of these things. So like I, re- I respect that. But this is inauditable. The guy who's telling, I mean, I, I've been to so many events, especially if Miami is like full of people like this right now, like love Miami, but it's like you go to a party and like, oh, I do this and I do that. And you're like, show me your bank account. Okay. Because you're staying at your mom's condo. So like, you know, I didn't see you fly. You know, it's just all performative. And the reason why is number one, it's to get girls. But number two is because there's an industry now. People make money out of seeming rich to get other people to sell them things. Like, so there's all this, like, there's an economy of, bs around convincing people you're successful and then you find out the truth what's the big could you could you look something up for me what's the big food shipping company that sends it to you in a box uh so i meet a guy at a party right and uh, i can't remember what it's called do you know what offhand the company you know you you order and a box of food comes like blue blue apron or that one like misfit foods or something yeah it's it might be blue apron it's one like that i don't want to say it's blue apron but you know let's just say it's red chef whatever it's the big one started in germany and everything so the guy goes i meet him at a party and he goes uh yeah i was the exam i was the founder of red chef but it's huge like they've raised billions of dollars of capital And uh, I was a founder of it. I was the exec, you know, I'm one of the founders and I was the executive chef. Mm -hmm. And so girls are twittering around him. I exchanged information with him. um, And, and the host of the party, you know, introduces him as sort of one of the celebrities of the party. I mean, in the way he introduces himself, you impute that he's probably got 200 to $300 million in free bank account cash. The way he carries himself, cool guy, kind of long hair, you know, not uh, too cool that he's dressed like Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean. But, you know, he's not dressed like a bunch of MBAs like us, um, not to criticize us. But he's a cool looking guy, girls around him, clearly, you know, and, oh, and I'm doing social investing now. I've moved on from regular investing. I'm only oh. investing in social enterprises. You know, I'm working on a set of cookbooks and uh, flying around and I'm going to London tomorrow. So, you know, the type. Except for I'm in venture capital every single day. I'm investing in companies and that's my job is diligence on these motherfuckers. So I look him up on the phone <laughs> just quickly. And it turns out this company has like in every city that they move into, they go to a, um, they, they uh, what is it? Hello fresh. There's an article on this. Like I'm, this is not an expose, right? And I'm not going to get sued for exposing this. This is in an article. So what they do is they go to a city that they want to penetrate and they go get a, they hire someone from Goldman Sachs an MBA, right? They send him to chef school for two weeks and they make him a founder of the company. And then they style him up. So you've got a hundred of these kids running around going, I'm the founder of HelloFresh, right? Uh, uh, really all they are is uh, retrograded MBAs running around acting like they have a hundred million dollars and they're the brand protagonists for that city for HelloFresh. Is this like Rocket Internet Company? Is that what we're talking about? Is that, uh, what is they're it? They're part of Rocket Internet? Is that the, the uh, I Well, I don't know, maybe. But that, that but was they're, kind of their model, like similar like the MBAs giving them like, small stakes in companies, but they owned everything and they would could run around and say they're founders because like titles are cheap, right? Like I can, I'm going to make you chief officer of my life right now. Or, and you know, it costs me nothing to do that. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. I got you. And so, so, so now smoke and mirrors. Now there's a bunch of girls going, I can't believe I slept with that guy, that jerk. So, uh, but true. And, and I think HelloFresh maybe invented that model and then rocket adopted it. But yeah, with today with so much capital, around and so uh so difficult to understand you know who's in crypto uh uh, the the lingo of having capital being in companies money everywhere but uh just i want to give you which is a quick example to level set if you're out there and you're you're fomoing fear of missing out that all these guys are money is raining from the sky you know they've done a quick deal this is their you know Oh, here's a big one. Like I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is my fifth deal. I've been in three transactions in three years. I'm on a transaction now. Say it's between three and $400 million. 
the sale has been going on for two and a half years of the company. Mm -hmm. Diligence, micro payments are going out all the time. Diligence continues every day. Even when the transaction is completely done, there's still holdbacks that are meaningful on the transaction. This is a well-known company, you know, internet company. You would recognize their name. You may have bought something from them, you know, almost a $400 million transaction. The level of diligence, the level of scrutiny, and the transaction isn't going through because of, uh, you know, it's sort of grinding itself to a slow halt because of, uh, you know, government oversight, because of legal. Like these transactions are very difficult to have happen. $200 million doesn't just sort of people meet in a day. They agree to $200 million. They put out a press release. The press release is $200 million. Do not have a fear of missing out. I would say, and I would ask you, how many of the press releases do you think kind of don't actually come to fruition? They're, they're like announcements on Shark Tank. I'll do that deal. But then they have to do diligence and, the, and you know, and the deals don't go through. Yeah. So, they renegotiate and then there's an escrow and a, and a hold back and then, I mean, even if your company goes public, files to go public. Okay, company files, right? There's another four months or whatever. Then there's the IPO, and then you're locked up and like rah rah rah. So you're talking a year. It's 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 not what people think. <laughs> it's not what you think. It's not what you think. For every one sort of easy win that you read about, there are hundreds of tales of misery, frustration emotional trauma and sadness. So give up now. Don't no, don't even try do, it. Do a lot of them so you're diversified. My exactly. buddy into it is looking for marketing coordinators. Um they're looking at, you know, I'll, I'll give you his number. Whatever your dreams are, set them aside. Go get a job at a big corporation. You can't do it. No. Um you can do it. So let's sort of shift into the positive side of it. Mm -hmm. On our way there, I listened to a pod, very interesting podcast you had with a guy named John Cohen, the 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 uh, the dinner guy, the guy who invites all. Oh, kinds John of Levy, John Levy, John Levy, Jewish guy, whatever. Uh, Levy, Cohen, Claff, McGinnis, all bunch of Jews. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> McGinnis, what is that? Comanche Romanian. It, so yeah, it's a, I'm actually only a quarter Irish. I'm mostly okay. French Canadian. Okay. That's why I'm so yeah. tall. All right. We have red hair and your name's McGinnis, but whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to sell us, uh, buddy. All right. So I've listened to that guy and he was all about the relationships and mm -hmm. right, which is create relationships. You, you want to give for people who aren't familiar with it, just a little bit of background on the thesis that John has about relationship. And then I want to give you a contrarian view to that mm -hmm. and see if you agree or disagree. Yeah. His whole thing is like build fundamentally deep relationships. He throws these dinner parties where he invites a diverse group of people. They're not allowed to say what they do. They cook dinner together. They kind of get to know each other at a human level. And then through that, they end up either like people got married, they do business deals, like blah, 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 blah. And it's about like getting back to basic human connection. That was very fast. Uh, so one of the things I think he left out is he tried to invite the most high status, mm. socially proofed, um, big accomplishment kind of people to put sort of the best of the best together. Mm. Mm. Right. And, uh, and, and that worked out for him. When I first got into on my own in venture capital and private equity, my thesis was very similar. Build a broad network of relationships. And because I have a charismatic personality, uh, you know, I had a good education. My parents were academics. Uh, you know, I sort of nosed my way into, and I was in Los Angeles into private equity. You know, I met with Alagoras, you know, billionaire. Uh, so, you know, I probably had a cadre of five or six billionaires on Insta dial, or I could go to their office. I worked in the office of one. I had a free office, you know, on Rodeo Drive. Uh, I plumbed around at U UCLA and um, Jet Propulsion Lab and knew the professors. I traded up on the professors into the low level venture groups. I traded the low level venture groups in Los Angeles up to pretty high level venture groups in San Francisco. And I just had this amazing network and I invested, oh God, I don't want to say you know, how many years, but years in building this network. And the net, you know, result of that was a big fucking donut. 
um, because the deals are so specific mm. that they don't necessarily, so, so say there's 350, 400 venture firms, right? And on top of that, say there's 350 private equity firms. And on top of that, you know, say there's, you know, in this game, maybe, uh, uh, the, the sort of the Nathan Mirvalds of the world who are, you know, billionaires, but operators. And then on top of that, there's sort of 17 true billionaires. And maybe on top of that, uh, you know, there's 60, $400 million guys kind of, you know, in, in the game, but that is a very complex network of finance across thousands of firms. And so you get a deal, right? It's an accounting software that uses AI to predict the likelihood of you getting an IRS audit and highlights those things so you can fix them before you file your taxes, right? Very specific thing, valuable, exciting, growing fast. But the chances that your relationship network is a solid match for that specific thing, I found to be very low. And so I, this, finally, I, I had a partner and he said, you got it all wrong, Warren. And this is my, this was the big takeaway. I'll let you comment it. Capital flows to deals. Yes. And in if fact, you got the deal, the money will worm its way and look for the deal and find its way in. Very hard to push deals uphill. Capital flows to deals. So how do you square these two perspectives? It's like this amazing investment in relationships and things happen but also capital comes to deals. It's very hard to take deals to capital. I agree. I think having the great network is great, but it's not sufficient because the reality is you could have a terrible network, but if you have a very specific knowledge of a sector and you have money, you're going to be able to do whatever you want. I, that, that's why you see people who are, you see this all the time. We all know that person who's so well connected, but they're never monetizing any of the stuff that they do because at the end of the day, like they're, unless you can really truly lock up a deal or it's your company or, or you are the capital holder, you know, when it comes to it, people will, maybe they'll throw you a bone, but you don't really, they don't need you anymore. Right. And so you've got to find a way to not just be the connector and know people, which by the way, I mean, that's a valuable thing. It's clearly valuable. But you have to have more than that. It's kind of like being so, nice. It's kind of like being nice. Being nice is great. But if you're just nice, that is not sufficient to, to be like a very successful person. Like people are like, oh, that person's so nice. Be nice and interesting. Be nice and smart. Like combine it with something else. It's just not enough at the end of the day to make sure that people want to have you in the room after you've done the job of bringing in the deal. So I think there, the, I mean, I feel like where we are right now is so important for everybody who is an aspiring deal maker or has been through a couple deal makers and feel like they have some perspective on it. I mean, this, I really feel like we're at the heart of the thin red line between success and failure. And that is that, uh, and you put it more eloquently than I did. I put it just very simply that capital will find its way into a good deal, no matter what your breadth of relationships are, who you know, where you can get. I can get to anybody. You need Joe Biden. Maybe not today because Afghanistan is turning into a shit of Stan today. So it might be hard for me to get Joe Biden on the phone today. But, you know, we grew up in Delaware. Our family is very close to their family. You know, I can call the guy up. So and, and maybe that's not good. Maybe it's very good. But anybody can be gotten to with the some very basic methodologies that, you know, we try and show business people, you can get anybody. And even, you know, today with LinkedIn and everything, you're, you're one or two steps removed, but anyway, you can get to anybody and you can get to anybody in a meaningful high status way and just kind of get your foot in the door and they'll listen to you, uh, for sure. But, but it's not, there's just, there's not a thing where you're on a plane, you're sitting down to Mark Cuban and you know, you're explaining to him your deal. And because you have proximity to Mark Cuban, that he has a bucket for that deal. It's a, it's, a, it's a mythology, you know, that you were thinking about starting a vodka company. You sit down to Mark Cuban or somebody on the plane. They're like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to, you know, invest in your vodka company. Uh, the, the, these, these random connections or these, these forced connections don't typically strike 
capital deals. Capital flows to very specific circumstances that are good deals in that for that capital bucket. Um, and so then, then the you know the the investing time in relationships, like if you've got the deal, you can get in the door there anyway. Because I think about it, like what are these guys? You know, um, when you think about venture firms, and I'll have you comment on this. When you think about private equity firms, you just think about investment. I want to get away from venture because there's so much like startup um, stuff. But but when you're at those firms, your job is to find deals. When somebody goes. Hey, you know, they're not replying to me. I got to find another way in. No, they're not replying to you because it's not a good deal for them. They are organized. They, I mean, they are like a, a, um, a, a okay. I don't want to get into men and women, but I mean, they are, you know, they're like a man or a woman going to a bar, you know, on a mission to find a spouse. They are, you know, that's 33 years old. They feel the clock is ticking. They, private equity firms are on a mission to find deals that they can get, you know, um, a success with their firm. They need to get the money out. It's not like a bank where they're, you know, approving. They, they want to get the money out. They're looking for deals. If you have even hint of quality, they're all over you. So what, how do we shift people's minds away from and, and I don't know if you're interested in partaking in this, like reaching out and building all this, investing all this time in these broad connection of relationships and missing out on just forming a quality deal. Yeah. I, listen, people pitch me on LinkedIn all the time. I'm sure you get these two, Oren. Like you get this pitch message in LinkedIn and I'm like, I don't know who you are. You've done no research on what I do. You've been sent me a deal that I have no insight into. Like, how? Why would you do that, right? Like, what? Can I? Sorry, Patrick. Can you can you hold on a second? I'm just investing in a barbecue AI company right now. Um, this <laughs> this is it just came in. I just I know, actually they, knew they a guy said, who wanted to do that. No lies, and he's a smart guy. So maybe I could hook you guys up together. But no, it's I'm sort of like I'm sort of like <laughs> you know like I ask people. I'll say I'll write them back again. I'll be like, does this work? And they're like, not really. And I'm like, exactly. Like, this is crazy. Why don't you get a couple customers, try to put some like sales together, right? So it, that kind of, I find that a little mind blowing, but I would say, listen, the reality, here's the sad reality of this thing is that even, okay, so yeah, you're pitching your deal and you're right. Like typically that's their job to find deals. And if they haven't responded, it's not because sometimes it is because they're, you sent it to the wrong person or because people are so busy, they forget and it falls off. And like, you've got to sort of make sure you get to the right person and all that sort of stuff. And that's probably 10% of the time or whatever. But the other thing is like plenty of firms, by the way, they do receive great deals that they should be investing in, but because of they're, they're lazy, they're looking for people like they're not, they're like, we want to invest in founders that look like us who went to these certain schools that do certain things. And like, we're just not going to take a risk outside of that. And that's why you see the fact that like, there isn't sufficient capital flowing into women and, 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 and to people of color, like, because people have cognitive biases and that sucks, but like, go to the people who are looking for the kind of company that you can present to them because people at the end of the day, like, sadly, you know, when they found that the, 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 the formula that they think works for them, they don't deviate. And frankly, they don't even think about deviating because they're so stuck in their cognitive bias. And so I would say, yes, number one, recognize that certain investors, like you, even if you show up their house, it's not going to be like in the, you know, and, and play, you know, music outside the window, like say anything, you're not going to like romance them. Like that only happens in the movies. Number two, that there are lots of investors with lots of capital right now that are looking for deals and you just need to do the research of figuring out how your deal corresponds to their company. And number three, when you show up, have something to show them have traction and spend less time cold calling Patrick and Oren on LinkedIn and more time trying to build your business so that you have something to show to the investors. So there, I think there's two things there. One, and we're trying to explain to people because a lot of people say, just get my foot in the door so I can pitch it. Mm. It's the way you get your foot in the door to me for to, to money specifically sales as well. And also relationships is very sensitive to who made the introduction. And if LinkedIn, you know, made the introduction to you, it is sort of the lower, lowest, you know what LinkedIn is? It's one level above, um, you know, I left a coupon flyer on the window of your car. Uh, and 
it, it's a very low status introduction and it's basically discounted. So as good as you are, the LinkedIn approach is, is like, hold that. If you think you found a good target, pull back on LinkedIn and find a good way in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go full on, you know, venture firm, say, hey, I need to get a, a reference from another venture firm. That's a very high bar introduction. But find a decent status way in is one thing uh, for sure, you know, rather than just find the first way in or try to get a foot in the door, whether it's sales or enterprise sales or B2B or venture capital or anything like that. But um, I think that's that's pretty obvious. I don't think we plumbed any new depths of human psychology there. But I do think I do want you to comment on this. I think if you want to know how an investor behaves, is going to behave on your deal, look at where the money came from on top of it. The Harvard Endowment is not looking to put crazy, high-risk, fast-moving, um, devil-may-care capital in your socially responsible uh, condo units that are automatically run on a new Airbnb system in Central America. It's just not their vision for what they do. And so you look, the the Boston Firemen's Fund, the Har Harvard Endowment, the Yale Endowment, the UCLA Endowment, like they want to do very specific things with their capital. And it's th their risk profile is very limited. So imagine what are they telling the investment managers to do with Harvard's money? And that's how you can predict or project what the, you know, how the firm you're approaching is going to react to you. Where is the money coming from? If the money came from, if I had a crazy Central America, you know, we're going to build in Ecuador, uh, you know, super high tech, fully automated Airbnb, AI, you know, for millennials that are self cleaning, you know, units in which they can, um, uh, you know, run their influencer podcasts and no one has to touch it. And it's at 60% uh, you know, profit margin, if we can build it and it's a heavy construction cost, you know, and we're developing technology at the same time. If I'm pitching that deal, I'm looking for totally crazy 26 year old, you know, who made $3 billion in crypto. And he has very loose rules on how he wants to deploy capital and what he's willing to put up with. And he's super adventurous. I'm not looking to be under the rule set of Harvard university. I mean, you're letting me um, die out on the uh, plank on this topic, and you're not jumping in to save me. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump concern. in. Well, first of all, Ecuador is not in Central America, so I'll give you that. Okay, but yeah, oh, well, I, uh, that's, th thank you. I stand corrected. No, no, no problem, man. It's uh, it, but but I would not invest in Ecuador. But here's the deal. I, yeah. I agree with you. I sound like Joe Biden. Here's the deal. Um, these endowments, when they invest in a VC fund, first of all, they're not investing in a first time fund. They they just don't. Unless it's like a guy who left Harvard, Harvard Management Company, and then they're like, "Well, we love you. We're going to stake you, right?" So, and I've, I've, I'm part of a VC fund in Latin America. We've been out raising money, and it's just like getting institutional investors on a first fund or even a second fund. They take years to get to know you and to understand your thesis. There, it's kind of like part of me is like, "Wow, that's so impressive." Part of me is like, "What is the point if you're not going to like yourself?" Kind of like everybody can always invest with Blackstone. Like nobody's going to get fired for that. But at the same time, like the real asymmetric returns are in some of these new funds, but they just don't, there's no incentive for them to take those kind of risks, right? And so, yeah, you're right. Like the, the chances of finding some sort of firm that's going to invest in your very esoteric deal, any of those firms are, that, are, that, are, that are backed by big institutional investors is zero. So go find, like you said, like family offices, people who are investing for more than the like, strictly profit reasons. Maybe they are interested in impact. There's a lot of that now. A lot of it's kind of bull, but there are people who really want to do impact investing and understanding like, you know, if you can't find the capital, then, you know, probably not the business for you. Right. But I, I want to give you a perfect example. If you can't find the capital, it's probably not the business for you. We have a dot here in San Diego. We have a husband and wife uh, doctor team. You know, they're affiliated with Nobel prize winners. Uh, the woman's a surgeon. Uh, she's inside of surgery every day with kids dealing with nerve damage and everything. They came up a molecule that improves the ability to, uh, I don't want to give any too much away, 
um, you know, to do these surgeries, like a massive improvement in the way life-saving surgeries can be done for our most impacted type of injuries, most difficult to save populations and really life-changing surgeries. They went out, they talked to 10 or 15 other doctors in their hospital system and affiliated hospital system, just, hey, we're doing this. We found some efficacy. We want to sort of uh, develop this product. Would you guys be interested? They got $15 million inside of 30 days and they've been operating the company. Like that is how it should feel. Yeah. That is an example of really how it goes. Yeah. And then you have, I mean, I, I had a, a guy I knew who was, you know, that one friend who's always doing like the new thing. It's like they they did dot com, then they did mortgages, then they did whatever. They're, they I, did I don't appreciate you describing me this way, Patrick, <laughs> in the public venue. You know, we're live here. I can hit, I may need to end broadcast. Well, there's the ways to do that where you're the leader and there's ways to do that where you're in the FOMO space. And like, I remember yeah. his whole thing was he was raising money for some companies. And so he brought this deal to me. And he brought it to everybody we knew. And it was, he couldn't actually explain the tech. To, it was this crazy, one of these things where it's like, well, it's a new kind of metal that, you know, flies on its own and also conducts energy. And if you like hold it, you know, you feel love for the first time or whatever. And you're sort of like, why am I meeting with you? And like, why have you brought this management team in here? Because like, number one, like you're asking for a minimum check of X, Y, Z that I'm never going to write something this kind of weird. But number two is like, have I ever like, why me? I know nothing about this. And I think like, he's just trying to show people that he has connections, but at the end, it's like a big waste of everybody's time because he hasn't actually figured out where the money is for the deal he wants to do. And by yeah. the way, there may not be any money and, and, and he shouldn't, you know, then they should all just move on. Yeah. The, the money will flow to you. If it makes sense, if you're really, you know, struggling to find money or customers uh, or partners, you know, then, then, I mean, you could be right, but you're probably not. Mm. What, uh, I want to talk about culture a little bit because I think you have a great, you know, being an author, I've been in Harvard, raising capital, being in New York, Santa Monica, you know, on the left and right coast, um, meeting a lot of interesting people on your podcast. You sort of do have some cultural perspective. I don't, I know you don't want to get, uh, very glad to have on the show Ben Shapiro. Ben, why are the left a bunch of assholes? No, uh, I, I know you don't want to get into left, right, but what problems are you seeing today that motivate you and you're concerned about? Yeah. So I'm not into left, right either. I'm I I am registered as a Democrat. I used to be a Republican, by the way, until 2016, and then I was like, no. I'm, I'm registered as a Democrat. I would be an independent, but unfortunately in my state, we don't have open primaries, which is like stupid in my opinion, um, because open primaries are a great way to let the 40% of Americans who are not in either party. Oh, the great, the great state of Ecuador. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think both political parties, there's a great book by Michael, um, by Michael Porter and Catherine Gale that's called the, pol the politics industry. And I had them both on my podcast, FOMO Sapiens. Yeah. And basically they looked at the political industry in the United States from the framework of Porter's five forces, which is the way that we analyze competition, um, his famous framework. And they found that the political parties in the United States are designed to self-perpetuate and gather resources in terms of power and money. They are not designed to serve the interests of their customers, which are the people. And so both political parties are just, they're about amassing capital and power and not letting new entrants in, which is why, like, in why we have like primaries where it's like Democrat, Republican, then they go to the final, and then you throw in the conservative or the, sorry, the independent, and they have no shot. So it's a bunch of malarkey. And so what I am focused on, and sort of like as we think about the world we we we're living in today, I've gotten pretty involved in politics, not from a ideological perspective, because like I don't people can believe what they want. It's fine by me. I don't really care. Um, I'm more focused on how do we create a system that reflects the will of the people, all the people, so that we have outcomes? We, we don't just have gridlock. We have bodies of government that can actually get things done, that can create an environment where business is thriving, where we're competitive. Because what we know now is because our, our government is so broken, the, the U.S. is less competitive on a global scale versus a lot of other countries. And so businesses are hobbled. No, no problem. But when you say it's broken, what are some of the things that are pissing you off about the system? You know, what, what do you perceive as broken? 
So I think there's a, a couple different things. Number one, like money in politics. There's way too much money in politics from corporations. Corporations have way more power than anybody else. Um, and so when you look at the actual bills that get passed, they much more reflect the interests of corporate citizens than they do of individual citizens. So like that's a big one. I think the fact that voting is so screwed up. And by the way, I'm not saying like from both sides, like it's hard to vote people who shouldn't be voting. Like, you know, there's no, like, there's like, just no systems. Like our tech is terrible. Like, you know, the fact that just like, it's like you have to wait in line for six hours and then like it takes 19 days to figure out who won. Like, bro, my, my dad was a demographer. It's crazy. My dad was a demographer and he would say, vote early and vote often. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's messed up. And then I think, okay. I think the fact that, that you have so little getting done where you have, you know, real challenges facing our country and that there is, it takes so long to grind through things. And when they do like, the, you know, you, they don't even know what are in these bills. Right. So like so much money being put out the door, you know, and by all the parties into things that like, there's no accountability, like the PPP program, like tons of money going to people who shouldn't have it. Like that was a fucking bums, mess. It just that bums was a me out. Fucking mess. Yeah. And so like, at the end of the day, what I like, there are good politicians on both sides, but the system is super broken and there's bad politicians on both sides too, but like there's no accountability because they're so gerrymandered that like people don't even have to like run on anything. So it's just, it's, there's a lot of big challenges and I'm, I've been working, I'm part of a group called leadership now project and we work on these kinds of issues. So, uh, so if you're interested in leadership now, that sounds like a good program. I'm happy to plug it. Is there, where, where does somebody go to leadership now? Uh, leadership. Now Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Great. Everybody I've uh, run over there. So anyway, no, go, ahead, go, go ahead, ahead, yeah. ahead, leadership now project.org. I mean, listen, I think it's really, we, we do, we, we're, like, we're almost like venture investors in the political space, which I really like. Right. Cause like yeah. at the end of the day, you have to have innovation. We need innovation in politics. So question for you and you're in the 33 to 36 range, 45. Okay. I try and do that. Just I, so just I, don't have, a, uh, I have a lot of, what do you call that thing? Uh, face tuning on. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I had a, uh, I had a call with Anthony Scaramucci and uh, we, you know, we have all these lights and he's like, you look like you're 200 years old. Yeah. He looks really good. He's I don't know how he does it, man. He keeps it like, well, apparently he, no, I, had, I, don't know. I had a very conflict driven podcast with him. If you want to watch it, uh, right. apparently he's got a face cream hydration cream company. And I'm like, bro, are you running a crypto fund, a hedge fund? You're trying to get back into government or you're doing a, uh, men's face cream products company. I'm confused. Like, who are you? Yeah, I thought really? he was like a hedge fund fund of funds guy. Like, like that yeah. worked really well, he you know, he is, he's actually a good guy. He went to Harvard. He was at Goldman Sachs twice. You know, he was in the administration for 11 days. Um, he's got some young kids yeah. that, that, uh, he's very, um, loves very much. And he's very well spoken. Once you get past all that stuff yeah. that you would otherwise see him, but I, I liked him a lot. Once we got past all that, you know, CNN, Fox, I was in the white house, yeah. crypto, nonsense but his actually i mean you know there has to be some elements of quality he was at goldman sachs for many years uh he's running eight billion dollars of other people's capital yeah of uh, course. You, you could argue that two billion dollars of it is like just floated in there but the other four billion didn't the public you know, eye is seductive right public yeah very seductive very seductive um but I, I thought he was very interesting caring thoughtful person mm -hmm. but uh, i'll tell you who i don't think is very interesting caring thoughtful person um is young people what are young people getting dumber like but here's right to find young people please. yes like um you know people your age no uh i'm i'm thinking you know sort of 19 to 23 by the way all the young people in this office just came streaming over here to hear this opinion but uh, I went to Valley McCarr. Uh, we, we, it was our anniversary. So last night we stayed at a hotel in La Jolla. I pull up and I'm on a phone call. Young guy comes out. He go, you know, I, I go, hey, bro, I'm on the phone. As soon as I'm done, you know, I'll check the car. And there's seven spots open. And the guy uh, goes back. He comes back four minutes later. I'm still on the phone, you know, trying to make a deal uh, with a private equity firm. And I go, hey, bro, I'm, I'm still on the phone, right? He goes, well, I need your key. I'm like, you need the key while I'm in the car? Yeah, like, I understand if you need the spot, then, you know, but there's seven open spots. Like, as soon as I'm off, I'll give you the key. 
He goes away. Come back five, five minutes later. He goes, I need the key, right? And and so I find that people are programmed today to one single job. And I don't know it's because of the phones. I don't know it's because of the extreme focus. But they seem like can't go one or two levels out into sensibility. You know, I said, you know, finally, my guy, leave me alone. You're having a brain aneurysm over this key that, I, you know, when I, when I get off the call, you know, I'll give you the key. And so then we, we get, we check in the hotel. Oh, the hotel, we had to change the date. So we call up the hotel desk. We go, Hey, we want to change the date. And she goes, I can't do that. You have to go to booking.com. I call booking.com. She goes, we can't change the date. You got to go. You got to call the company. I get both of them on the phone at the same time. I'm like, please, God, you knuckleheads got to figure this out. And I had to help step them through all the way. And then we go to dinner and we have a little boy, seven years old. Um, then you're, you're not, you don't have kids. No, not yet. You're working yet. on it. Working oh, on you it. do. No, I, I'm, it's not, I don't have a child yet. It's in, okay. it's in the, it's in the general plan. Got it. So you're humping away like a madman trying to get a kid. I strongly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, if you want any advice on that, happy to Thank do you. it, you know, offline, but basically it's just hump until a kid comes out, you know, backseat of the Camaro, 200 mile up hundred mile club, two mile club, whatever it is, just keep humping. A kid will show up eventually. Um, but that's my general advice or do IVF, but sorry. So we go to a restaurant and, uh, you know, we have a seven year old and we're checking the restaurant. It's like seven 30. He's super hungry. Cause he just got back from hockey practice and she goes, Hey, uh, you know, I can put you on a wait list. I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to be on a wait list because you know, we have a hungry seven year old. She goes, well, I can put you in at 10 45, you know, guaranteed slot. I mean, it's seven 30. Like, am I going to wait three hours without it? And, and I just feel like over and over and over and again, you have people who are very specifically trained on a job on the screen inside of technology, reading what's in the screen, programmed to one thing, and have trouble looking one degree of separation outside of what they've been trained on. And it didn't feel to me like it was like that pre iPhone. Am I, I? I wonder. Let me let me th throw a counterfactual at you. Yeah. You just give me an example of people that are probably paid not very much money and probably don't really care when you complain. Because they're like, I don't care anymore. I just listened to, I was reading an article and, and listening to a podcast about the great resignation. People are quitting their jobs en masse because they're like, I work in this job. They treated me like crap during the pandemic. And frankly, like, I just don't care. So maybe they, I mean, I think that there is a general lack of like well-roundedness in our educational systems now because people don't get, you know, they don't get the well, sort of well-rounded education and people have been learned kind of, now we just look everything up on our phones. But at the same time, like there are plenty of really smart young people that are like starting businesses and, and doing great things. But I just think that in general, throughout like lower wage work, people just don't care anymore because they feel like nobody cares about them. And so when we complain, they're like, eh, you know, I, I, that could be happening as well. Yeah. I don't know if that's a counterfactual. I think that's an additional factual. Okay. Yeah. I've, <laughs> uh, how do you say like uh, ambifactual? I don't know. Another yeah. factual. Yeah. Uh, and, and so then the, the, I agree. There's just a lot of apathy and not caring about the outcome. Is it because there's just so many safety net, you can do the gig economy, you can get onto, uh, something, you know, and do a Photoshop edit or a, um, you know, something on Fiverr, or you can work for Uber. You, you just feel like there's all these multiple safety nets because I think pre sort of the gig economy, you felt the bottom. Mm. I think people felt the presence of the bottom much more viscerally and you could see the bottom and it looked like it was made of concrete and it was hard. And now through fiber and through uh, OnlyFans or through, you know, well, that's probably at the closer to the bottom, but, right. um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so th through Fiverr and, um, um, Insta work or we work or indeed.com, there's just so many layers of way and, and Uber and Lyft and driving. There's so many ways to bring in a little bit that you're not worried about losing what you have. And I think it's concerning to me because I see it prevalent through almost every service, everything we use, you know, we're, we're, uh, throughout culture that there is the really a tough ability to think from one standard deviation from what they're immediately trained on.
That may be true. And by the way, I think about what you just said about this kind of safety net. Yeah, I mean, there is a perception of safety. The reality is that like being an Uber driver is a super big grind, right? And like once you get into that space, you realize like many of those gig economy jobs, like it's you can barely scrape together a living as well. I know, but it's it stops you from bouncing off the concrete. Yeah, totally. And, and I think also right now, because of like the all of the stimulus that was given to people, they were able to sort of, you know, make more not working than if they took some of these low wage jobs. So like we're in a weird time. And I think also a lot of people just like are super tired, like they're just not themselves. But you're, I do agree with you. Like we've taken work and we've made work less interesting for the people who do it. When you're just doing something so boring, like why do you care? You're smart. I think that's it. I think it, everything's been so refined that we've said, hey, we can, I think it's all about scale. Mm -hmm. I know we're, we're cresting on time. I think when you say, when you have super smart guys like Patrick saying, Hey, we got to design a, you know, something that scales. Well, when you have scale, then you can take people and put them in very, it, it's sort of the Ford factory, you know, repeated again, uh, for the modern times. Now you can say, all right, you repeat this single digital task over and over and over again. And by the way, breathing down your neck is the AI that we're trying to train to take over whatever it is that you do. Uh, and so with scale comes ability to add people on hyper-focused tasks because you can lever them to do the same thing over and over again because you've got size. And then as you have repetition for human-driven tasks and you can train the AI, and uh, I think people are going, the AI is behind me. The work is not very interesting. I'm in a in a company that scales. There's three dudes at the top who are on Instagram. Dan Bilzerian driving around in you know yachts and and you know living in mansions and showing us their fantastic life. The rest of us are grinding it out in the coal mines of technology, and uh, it's not very compelling. Mm. I think that's I think that's right, and it's and that's and it's that's. That's depressing, right? Because it has to be that we can find a way to make people's work more meaningful because it's important to work. Like just sitting around all day or feeling like you're not adding value. That's why people become disengaged. That's why people don't feel a sense of purpose or a unity in our society. Like it causes a ton of bad things to happen. And it's some of the reason why we see so much conflict. So you, you, I, I think it's a really important, important problem, but you know, nobody seems to be focused on it. So let's focus on it. Yeah, let's do it. Here's how this, by the way, folks, this here's how this works. I just wait for Patrick to say something super smart. And then I say, you know, five minutes of stuff around it to try and hijack the smart things he's saying. But I think you're you're uncovering really the, the, the basic foundation here. So um, I want to get you out of here and back to your job and everything. We want to know how, it, thank you for contributing so much of your time, your mental energy and your your thought patterns to this. Um, just maybe as we as we head out, what, what's exciting you about what you're seeing? You know, other than the AI can do lots of stuff and, uh, you know, work is getting easier and, you know, we can scale companies so we can add, you know, a quality of life, you know, all the sort of Ben Shapiro cliche, the quality of life of the, you know, average uh, um, poor, uh, you know, worker in a large American city is better than a king would have been in 14, yeah. in the Battle of Hastings, 1066. Like I sort of, we know all that, but what, what in your mind is interesting and worth getting excited about? Cause we talked about some of the rough edges yeah. uh, on the fringes of politics and the fringes of culture on the fringes of concern over young people and psychology and technology. But what for you is you're going, wow, you know, space or. Yeah. I'll tell you a couple of things. Well, first of all, I think Ben Shapiro is a false prophet and he's just a bad dude. So I just want to put that on the record on the internet. Number two, I want to say that I think what's interesting is we don't get to see this as much right now because we're all kind of internally focused, but innovation is not just coming from Silicon Valley. It's coming from everywhere, the heartland. It's coming from all over the world. Like, so I do a lot of venture capital in Latin America and the amount of like truly innovative ideas that we're seeing that we can then bring to the US is amazing. And so I think that's important because the more entrepreneurs and problem solvers and innovators that you have in places where they didn't exist before means that you're going to have opportunities for, you know, great ideas that benefit us to flow into our, into our culture as well. And also you're going to have like 
less poverty around the world. You're going to have more cooperation. So I'm hopeful about the, the, the world going forward because I think that like I, good ideas can propagate faster than they ever have before. And we have much more connectivity to do that. And I also think that like I had a really awesome guy on my podcast called Sergey Young who uh, wrote a book called The Science and Technology of Growing Young. And it was all about longevity. And like a lot of that stuff is, you know how like these singularity university people are like, well, in three years, we'll be able to grow a new kidney in a, you know, in a lab. You're like, no, that's probably not going to happen. Listen, motherfucker, the first 500-year-old man was born 10 years ago. Is that, is that, is no, that? No, that's just, that, that's yeah, that's, the, that's yeah. the, that's the Instagram. That's good though. I mean, I'm like, hmm, but, but I do think it's good marketing. I got to give them like a little, a little, like the smallest clap in the universe. But I will say that like, I do <laughs> really like the fact that people are putting money, big money into things that will fundamentally transform our health. Like that's, that's huge. Now the environment, we may like live long enough so that we all get t swallowed by the sea or something. So that's not awesome. But there's a really cool tech that's happened. It's beyond like, hey, I invented an app to get to find out your dog's favorite toys. Like, no, like deep tech that's going to change the way we live. That's happening right now. And it's it's amazing. So th thank you for saying that. I would just want to share one thing. One thing that I love is happening now is science fiction. Like when I was growing up, science fiction was like fucking wormholes in outer space and alien culture and still science fiction is a lot of that. But if you really, the science fiction is getting a lot closer to three generations of technology reality, like the mech suits, the injectable antigens, uh, the, you know, the AI, uh, the, the, uh, you know, ability of bots to go find, you know, injured soldiers and treat them on the spot and regrow limbs and everything. I, I read a, I read a series called fear the sky and fear the survivors by, I don't know, whoever fear the sky, fear the survivors. But, uh, this, the storytelling was pretty cool and it, you know, did involve aliens and that kind of thing, but the technology felt like right at wow. the tip. And so I love some of the science fiction writing that's coming out now because it really, you got some really smart, technically capable writers who aren't just going 5,000 years in the future where anything, you know, trouble with tribbles getting Klingons can happen. They're really thinking about what happens to generations of the technology that we have today. You know, like the space elevator, the, you know, can that really happen? The, the, and, you know, as I said, the injectable antigens, the mech suits, the, you know, longevity, the things that AI can do, the predictability, the lack. So, so, so pulled in tighter than minority report, but two generations of tech forward is just some amazing science fiction writing. Uh, so I'm really enjoying that in our culture. That's cool. Love it. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with you, send you back to the coal mine. Thank you so much for sharing the insights that are born of experience in real deal making. Hopefully Patrick didn't insult anybody, you know, during the um, podcast today, I did try to curb his language and his, <laughs> uh, um, um, you know, sort of characterizing disadvantaged parts of our culture from being lesser than, but you know, I know some things squeak through, but we apologize in advance. No, uh, Patrick, you're, you're very smooth. I appreciate you. Thanks, so man. let's do it again uh, and make sure oh, to check out FOMO Sapiens, which is Patrick's very interesting podcast. I listened to a few episodes and I will say this, it's m much more methodical than what we just went through. So if you like your programming, thoughtful, laid out in a clear agenda and plumbing real topics carefully and methodically, FOMO Sapiens is for you. If you like this, then come I back. I can't do this, man. I like this. I just can't do it. So it's really fun to be with you because I was like, I was like thinking to myself, I was like, wow, this is really fun, you know, interesting. And, you know, but yeah, it's a different style, but, you know, they, they both fit in. So the great thing is, we both have great voices. <laughs> well, having uh, uh, ha the last thing I would say is with you, having a good podcast with you, I feel like is a real achievement because you're not conflict driven and you're not interested in catching people in an oops, mm. calling it out, and then ex you know trying to f so expose them as having 
outside the norm thinking and getting a credit point for having done that. Yeah. And so you're not conflict driven and you're really sort of authentically trying to plumb what's going on in both our minds and come up with something new and insightful. And so having a conversation with you uh, is more challenging because we can't get the natural entertainment on conflict. We really got to find the nuggets. So thanks for bringing them. And I hope yeah, to man. see you here again. All right. Talk to you soon, Patrick. Take care. Bye now. Hey, thanks for listening. And be sure to stay tuned for more great content from Oren Claff. If you want to get daily insights and additional assets, go to orenclaff.com slash daily and sign up for a seven-day trial of The Daily Dealmaker. See you next time.